Chapter Nine of Bunner Sisters. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Evelina's marriage took place on the appointed day. It was celebrated in the evening in the chantry of the church which the sisters attended, and after it was over, the few guests who had been present repaired to the Bunner sisters' basement, where a wedding supper awaited them. Ann Eliza, aided by Miss Mellins and Mrs. Hawkins, and consciously supported by the sentimental interest of the whole street, had expended her utmost energy on the decoration of the shop in the back room. On the table a vase of white chrysanthemums stood between a dish of oranges and bananas and an iced wedding cake wreathed with orange blossoms of the bride's own making. Autumn leaves studded with paper roses festooned the what-not and the chromo of the rock of ages, and a wreath of yellow immortelles was twined about the clock which Evelina revered as the mysterious agent of her happiness. At the table sat Miss Mellins, profusely spangled and bangled, her head sewing girl, a pale young thing who had helped with Evelina's outfit, Mr. and Mrs. Hawkins with Johnny, their eldest boy, and Mrs. Hochmuller and her daughter. Mrs. Hochmuller's large, blonde personality seemed to pervade the room to the effacement of the less amply proportioned guests. It was rendered more impressive by a dress of crimson poplin that stood out from her in organ-like folds, and Linda, whom Ann Eliza had remembered as an uncouth child with a sly look about the eyes, surprised her by a sudden blossoming into feminine grace such as sometimes follows on a gawky girlhood. The Hochmullers, in fact, struck the dominant note in the entertainment. Beside them Evelina, unusually pale in her grey cashmere and white bonnet, looked like a faintly washed sketch beside a brilliant chromo, and Mr. Ramy, doomed to the traditional insignificance of the bridegroom's part, made no attempt to rise above his situation. Even Miss Mellins sparkled and jingled in vain in the shadow of Mrs. Hochmuller's crimson bulk, and Ann Eliza, with a sense of vague foreboding, saw that the wedding feast centred about the two guests she had most wished to exclude from it. What was said or done while they all sat about the table she never afterward recalled. The long hours remained in her memory as a whirl of high colours and loud voices, from which the pale presence of Evelina now and then emerged like a drowned face on a sunset-dabbled sea. The next morning Mr. Ramy and his wife started for St. Louis, and Ann Eliza was left alone. Outwardly, the first strain of parting was tempered by the arrival of Miss Mellons, Mrs. Hawkins, and Johnny, who dropped in to help in the ungarlanding and tidying up of the back room. Ann Eliza was duly grateful for their kindness, but the talking over on which they had evidently counted was dead sea fruit on her lips and just beyond the familiar warmth of their presences she saw the form of solitude at her door. Ann Eliza was but a small person to harbor so great a guest, and a trembling sense of insufficiency possessed her. She had no high musings to offer to the new companion of her hearth. Every one of her thoughts had hitherto turned to Evelina and shaped itself in homely easy words, of the mighty speech of silence she knew not the earliest syllable. Everything in the back room in the shop, on the second day after Evelina's going, seemed to have grown coldly unfamiliar. The whole aspect of the place had changed with the changed conditions of Ann Eliza's life. The first customer who opened the shop door startled her like a ghost, and all night she lay tossing on her side of the bed, sinking now and then into an uncertain doze from which she would suddenly wake to reach out her hand for Evelina. In the new silence surrounding her, the walls and furniture found voice, frightening her at dusk and midnight with strange sighs and stealthy whispers. 
Ghostly hands shook the window shutters or rattled at the outer latch, and once she grew cold at the sound of a step like Evelina's stealing through the dark shop to die out on the threshold. In time, of course, she found an explanation for these noises, telling herself that the bedstead was warping, that Miss Mellon's trod heavily overhead, or that the thunder of passing beer wagons shook the door latch. But the hours leading up to these conclusions were full of the floating terrors that harden into fixed foreboding. Worst of all were the solitary meals, when she absently continued to set aside the largest slice of pie for Evelina, and to let the tea grow cold while she waited for her sister to help herself to the first cup. Miss Mellons, coming in on one of these sad repasts, suggested the acquisition of a cat, but Ann Eliza shook her head. She had never been used to animals, and she felt the vague shrinking of the pious from creatures divided from her by the abyss of soullessness. At length, after ten empty days, Evelina's first letter came. "'My dear sister,' she wrote in her pinched Spencerian hand, "'it seems strange to be in this great city so far from home with him I have chosen for life, but marriage has its solemn duties which those who are not can never hope to understand. And happier, perhaps, for this reason, life for them has only simple tasks and pleasures.' but those who must take thought for others must be prepared to do their duty in whatever station it has pleased the Almighty to call them. Not that I have cause to complain, my dear husband is all love and devotion, but being absent all day at his business, how can I help but feel lonesome at times? As the poet says, it is hard for they that love to live apart, and I often wonder, my dear sister, how you are getting along alone in the store. May you never experience the feelings of solitude I have underwent since I came here. We are boarding now, but soon expect to find rooms and change our place of residence. Then I shall have all the care of a household to bear, but such is the fate of those who join their lot with others. They cannot hope to escape from the burdens of life, nor would I ask it. I would not live always, but while I live I would always pray for the strength to do my duty. This city is not near as large or handsome as New York, but had my lot been cast in a wilderness, I hope I should not repine. Such never was my nature, and they who exchange their independence for the sweet name of wife must be prepared to find all is not gold that glitters, nor I would not expect like you to drift down the stream of life unfettered and serene as a summer cloud. Such is not my fate, but come what may will always find me in a resigned and prayerful spirit, and hoping this finds you as well as it leaves me, I remain, my dear sister, yours truly, Evelina B. Ramey. Ann Eliza had always secretly admired the oratorical and impersonal tone of Evelina's letters, but the few she had previously read, having been addressed to schoolmates or distant relatives, had appeared in the light of literary compositions rather than as records of personal experience. Now she could not but wish that Evelina had laid aside her swelling periods for a style more suited to the chronicling of homely incidents. She read the letter again and again, seeking for a clue to what her sister was really doing and thinking, but after each reading she emerged impressed but unenlightened from the labyrinth of Evelina's eloquence. During the early winter she received two or three more letters of the same kind, each enclosing in its loose husk of rhetoric a small kernel of fact. By dint of patient interlinear study, Ann Eliza gathered from them that Evelina and her husband, after various costly experiments in boarding, had been reduced to a tenement-house flat, that living in St. Louis was more expensive than they had supposed, and that Mr. Ramey was kept out late at night. Why at a jeweler's, Ann Eliza wondered, and found his position less satisfactory than he had been led to expect. Toward February the letters fell off, and finally they ceased to come. 
At first Ann Eliza wrote, shyly but persistently, entreating for more frequent news, then, as one appeal after another was swallowed up in the mystery of Evelina's protracted silence, vague fears began to assail the elder sister. Perhaps Evelina was ill, and with no one to nurse her but a man who could not even make himself a cup of tea. Ann Eliza recalled the layer of dust in Mr. Ramy's shop, and pictures of domestic disorder mingled with the more poignant vision of her sister's illness. But surely, if Evelina were ill, Mr. Ramy would have written. He wrote a small, neat hand, and epistolary communication was not an insuperable embarrassment to him. The too probable alternative was that both the unhappy pair had been prostrated by some disease which left them powerless to summon her, for summon her they surely would, Ann Eliza with unconscious cynicism reflected, if she or her small economies could be of use to them. The more she strained her eyes into the mystery, the darker it grew, and her lack of initiative, her inability to imagine what steps might be taken to trace the lost in distant places, left her benumbed and helpless. At last there floated up, from some depth of troubled memory, the name of the firm of St. Louis Jewelers by whom Mr. Ramy was employed. After much hesitation and considerable effort, she addressed to them a timid request for news of her brother-in-law, and sooner than she could have hoped the answer reached her. Dear Madam, in reply to yours of the twenty-ninth ultimate, we beg to state the party referred to was discharged from our employ a month ago. We are sorry we are unable to furnish you with his address. Yours respectfully, Ludwig N. Hammerbusch. Ann Eliza read and re-read the curt statement in a stupor of distress. She had lost her last trace of Evelina. All that night she lay awake, revolving the stupendous project of going to St. Louis in search of her sister, but though she pieced together her few financial possibilities with the ingenuity of a brain used to fitting odd scraps into patchwork quilts, she woke to the cold daylight fact that she could not raise the money for her fare. Her wedding gift to Evelina had left her without any resources beyond her daily earnings, and these had steadily dwindled as the winter passed. She had long since renounced her weekly visit to the butcher, and had reduced her other expenses to the narrowest measure, but the most systematic frugality had not enabled her to put by any money. In spite of her dogged efforts to maintain the prosperity of the little shop, her sister's absence had already told on its business. Now that Ann Eliza had to carry the bundles to the dyers herself, the customers who called in her absence, finding the shop locked, too often went elsewhere. Moreover, after several stern but unavailing efforts, she had had to give up the trimming of bonnets, which in Evelina's hands had been the most lucrative as well as the most interesting part of the business. This change to the passing female eye robbed the shop window of its chief attraction, and when painful experience had convinced the regular customers of the Bunner sisters of Ann Eliza's lack of millinery skill, they began to lose faith in her ability to curl a feather or even freshen up a bunch of flowers. The time came when Ann Eliza had almost made up her mind to speak to the lady with puffed sleeves, who had always looked at her so kindly, and had once ordered a hat of Evelina. Perhaps the lady with puffed sleeves would be able to get her a little plain sewing to do, or she might recommend the shop to friends. Ann Eliza, with this possibility in view, rummaged out of a drawer the fly-blown remainder of the business cards which the sisters had ordered in the first flush of their commercial adventure, but when the lady with puffed sleeves finally appeared she was in deep mourning, and wore so sad a look that Ann Eliza dared not speak. She came in to buy some spools of black thread and silk, and in the doorway she turned back to say, I am going away to-morrow for a long time. I hope you will have a pleasant winter. And the door shut on her. 
One day, not long after this, it occurred to Ann Eliza to go to Hoboken in quest of Mrs. Hochmuller. Much as she shrank from pouring her distress into that particular ear, her anxiety had carried her beyond such reluctance, but when she began to think the matter over she was faced by a new difficulty. On the occasion of her only visit to Mrs. Hochmuller, she and Evelina had suffered themselves to be led there by Mr. Ramy, and Ann Eliza now perceived that she did not even know the name of the laundress's suburb, much less that of the street in which she lived. But she must have news of Evelina, and no obstacle was great enough to thwart her. Though she longed to turn to some one for advice, she disliked to expose her situation to Miss Mellins's searching eye, and at first she could think of no other confidant. Then she remembered Mrs. Hawkins, or rather her husband, who, though Ann Eliza had always thought him a dull, uneducated man, was probably gifted with a mysterious masculine faculty of finding out people's addresses. It went hard with Ann Eliza to trust her secret even to the mild ear of Mrs. Hawkins, but at least she was spared the cross-examination to which the dressmaker would have subjected her. The accumulating pressure of domestic cares had so crushed in Mrs. Hawkins any curiosity concerning the affairs of others that she received her visitor's confidence with an almost masculine indifference, while she rocked her teething baby on one arm, and with the other tried to check the acrobatic impulses of the next in age. "'My, my,' she simply said as Ann Eliza ended. "'Keep still now, Arthur. Miss Bunner don't want you to jump up and down on her foot to-day. "'And what are you gaping at, Johnny? Run right off and play,' she added, turning sternly to her eldest, who, because he was the least naughty, usually bore the brunt of her wrath against the others. "'Well, perhaps Mr. Hawkins can help you,' Mrs. Hawkins continued meditatively, while the children, after scattering at her bidding, returned to their previous pursuits like flies settling down on the spot from which an exasperated hand has swept them. "'I'll send him right round the minute he comes in, and you can tell him the whole story. I wouldn't wonder, but he can find that Mrs. Hochmuller's address in the directory. I know they've got one where he works.' "'I'd be real thankful if he could,' Ann Eliza murmured, rising from her seat with the fictitious sense of lightness that comes from imparting a long-hidden dread. End of chapter 9